As Diana mentioned, uh, this is, uh, we honour this as Aboriginal Sunday, and if you could put that next picture up, that would be great. Um, back in 1938, I think it was, this man, who is probably my, the man I admire most, I think, in Australian history, a man I hadn't even heard of till about three or well, six or seven years ago, who, um, a Christian man, an extraordinary story about um, his involvement with his own people, his polite but very firm arguments with Australian uh, legal authorities and governments for the uh, fair treatment of his own people. And if you've never heard of William Cooper, uh, as you leave the building, there's an article um, that you can take, which is a short article of some aspects of his life. It misses some of the more exciting parts, I think, but it'll give you an introduction to this truly great man. And he asked his Christian brothers and sisters to honour the Sunday before Australia Day uh, to be called Aboriginal Sunday. Um, he wanted his people to be prayed for and to be not forgotten. And up until the referendum in the 60s when, uh, you know, the big one about the Aboriginal citizenship in Australia, many, many, many churches did. But I think there was a sense that, well, okay, that's, that was one of his great goals. He was the first guy that we know of who began to argue for this, the changing of the Constitution and other things, land rights and things like that. Um, and I think people thought, okay, well, that's been done. We can... But then there's a recognition, as we know, that much more needs to be done. So um, you might like to take that article uh, as you leave. And I've asked uh, one of our Aboriginal members of our church uh, to lead in, uh, today in the acknowledgement of country. So, Kim, if you'd come and lead us in that, that would be great. As we gather in the presence of God, the maker and owner of all land and all living creatures, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet this day and all year. In his wisdom and love, our Heavenly Father gave this estate to the Ngunnawal people. Upon this land they met for many, many generations until the coming of the British settlers, which they experienced as invaders. As we continue to learn to live together on these ancient lands, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the Ngunnawal elders, past and present, and pray that God will unite us all in the knowledge of his Son, in whom all things were created, in heaven and on earth, whether visible or invisible. For all things have been created through Christ and for him. Thank you. Please take a seat and before we sing, we're going to pray. <laughs> Alice and I were chatting yesterday about our favourite songs and I said, I think this is my favourite one, so just delaying the pleasure only intensifies it. Uh, let's pray about some of these areas of life. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all that is good and beautiful amongst the First Nation peoples of this land, Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. And Father, we do acknowledge with sadness and some shame the past injustices and the terrible bloodshed that they have endured due to covetousness, greed and violence and sometimes damage done even from people of good intent who simply lacked wisdom. And Father, we do acknowledge that so much of our present wealth is derived because our national ancestors took the land, often at gunpoint, and became owners of it. We acknowledge with sorrow the terrible struggles that are still faced by Aboriginal people and especially the terrible and deep pain and despair of young Aboriginals. Father, we ask for your forgiveness for wrongs done, for past failures to act and to listen deeply. Father, we do praise you for men and women like William Cooper, our brother, that extraordinary human. And we thank you for wonderful Aboriginal Christian leaders and thinkers like Auntie Jean and many others 
Thank you, Father, that so many of Cooper's dreams and hopes have been fulfilled, although long after his death. And Lord Jesus, we at St. Matt's are yours. We're your people. Please show us how we can be a true blessing to our nation, especially in learning from and doing good to Aboriginal Christian brothers and sisters. We thank and praise you for the Waltons who spoke here at church a couple of weeks ago as they seek to be of service to Aboriginal people. Please make them truly useful and fruitful. And we also pray that you would give to our national leaders compassion, true wisdom and courage to act well and rightly. Please strengthen our resolve to be people of peace and reconciliation. The people that you would have us to be. Empower us to live out your word as we await the coming of you as our saviour. And our Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first reading is taken from John's Gospel, chapter 11, reading from verses 21 to 43. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know, he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister, Mary, aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this, for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, um, this is the last of a 
what I found to be an interesting and refreshing series on summer shorts. Um, I, there's been enormous pressure put upon me, but I refuse to wear shorts, although I might do it tonight. But you probably can't back up anyhow because of the limits on space. But a quick bit of review, if we can, on um, what we've been seeing, in case you've been away. So the first one, remember, we just chose shortest. I had practically no idea except this one, what, they, um, what was in them. So we did the shortest chapter. Turned out to be Psalm 127. Uh, sorry, 117. And it was a great call at the beginning of the year to praise God. Uh, why? Why should you do that? Because his love is steadfast. And it's not just a reminder for us, the people who are enjoying that love, to be you know, rowdy and joyful in our celebration of God, but also an invitation to those who don't know him to come and get to know him and join in it. It really is the Old Testament um, way of speaking about what we might call sharing our faith or evangelising. So that was the first one. The second one, uh, they're in colours of the old ribbons you used to get for athletics, so the blue was first. This is supposed to be reddish without being blinding. The prophet Obadiah, the, the shortest Old Testament book, which we discover to be about human pride and the fact that it will be humbled. Right? As the Bible says elsewhere, pride comes before a fall and a haughty look before destruction. So it was to do with the people of Edom who were in an impregnable fortress of uh, in the mountains they lived in and they were mocking and jeering and being cruel and God says, the day of the Lord will come. He, he says, I will bring you down. The third one we looked at last week was about truth and love. It's the shortest letter, shortest book in the New Testament. And that very telling verse 9, anyone... Oh, that, see what's happening with that wolf in sheep's clothing? It's eating up the Bible verse. Right? So it says very simply, anyone who does not remain in the teaching but goes beyond it, very clearly, he says, does not have God. Very serious to improve uh, the teaching of Jesus and to make it fit your cultural schemes. And so we're called on to watch ourselves because there are wolves in sheep's clothing as much as now as there were in the first century. And so today we come to the shortest verse in the Bible. Um, that's really trivia, isn't it? I mean, in a sense. There's great things in this shortest verse in the Bible, as you might expect. Um, before we pray, does anyone who didn't come to the Tuesday service know the first time in the Bible where we have a record of someone crying? Tears in the Bible. I don't expect you to, frankly, because if you'd asked me, I wouldn't have had a clue, but, you, but many of you read the Bible more often than I have. First example of someone crying in the Bible. Right? Well, I know some of you know, but you don't want to brag. That's okay. It's Abraham... And where is he crying? At the funeral of his wife, when he's burying Sarah. The most obvious natural thing in the world. There are other uh, places. Um, people cry when their children die. David does that. Tamar cries because she's been raped by her stepbrother. There are all sorts of times when people weep in the Bible. And we're going to look at one of the two times when the Gospels record Jesus weeping. Uh, there's an indication from Hebrews that he weeps at one other time. Uh, so let's pray that it would not just be interesting and Bible trivia, but perhaps even life transforming. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your presence here with us as you promised. And we do pray that as we watch uh, what you did and try to understand why you did it, that you would speak to each one of us. Thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So please, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, help us to see you and therefore to see your Father. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, just because I know that there are some highly intelligent, trivia-concerned folk here in the building, some of you will know that there are contests about which is the shortest verse in the Bible. So, for example, and we might come back to this right at the end, Arguably, the shortest verse in the Bible in the original language is actually 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16. 
which has got the very simple, straightforward uh, call, rejoice always. Rejoice always. And that's 14 verses in the original Greek, whereas the, verses, the verse we're looking at today is 16 letters, I should say, in the original Greek. But we're looking at the English version, okay? because most of us here don't speak New Testament Greek. Um, so we're going to look at the shortest one in the English and there's a very real sense, I think, if you get the, the, the meaning and the value and the treasure in this, uh, these two words, it will really help you to rejoice always. So, context always matters. I remember as a youth worker being in training, John Kitson, the, the great trainer I had uh, at the time, was running this high school seminar and he asked, opened up for questions and someone said, the Bible's full of contradictions. How can we take it serious? It's full of contradictions. And John gently but firmly said, would you like to name one? Of course, she didn't have a clue. As, uh, you, you may have a great professor you know, of something say that to you once. Very likely, if you ask them the question politely, they won't have a clue. It's a learnt thing. Anyhow, so John said, I can help you. I've got a contradiction. He said, okay, what is it? He said, well, it says in the Bible, there is no God. And... His conversation partner was rejoicing. There you go, you see. There is no God. The bot's full of... And John said, now let me put it in context. Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now it was, it was... He did it gently, but it was fairly brutal. But it is true if you have no real deep desire to hear the message of the Bible, you can find all sorts of contradictions. But context is the thing that helps us to hear what God is saying. So the context of John 11, um, verse 35, Jesus wept. Yes, of course, John 11. I'm not going to take you right back to the beginning of John 1, which would then take us right back to the beginning of the Bible, that, that just to get the real context. But just very quickly, the story, the very famous story, and again, if you haven't read it in the last few months or years, do read it. It's what Sundays are for, or one of the reasons. The first 16 verses introduce us to a troubling Jesus, then we run into the truth from Jesus, then the tears of Jesus, and then the triumph of Jesus. Verse 1 to 16 are troubling because Jesus is a long way from where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus live. They're a little family unit, two sisters and a brother. They send him a message, Lord, the one who you love is ill. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was for two more days. Now, that is not how you show love for someone, isn't it? They send you a message, Lord, the one who you love is ill. Clearly, he's very sick. You don't send a message to someone who's, you know, quite a way away just to let them know that someone's got a cold or a sniffle. But so Jesus loves them, so what does he do? He waits he waits two more days. You know what happens in that time? Then Jesus turns to his disciples in verse 11 and says, Lazarus has fallen asleep. I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples say, if he's just asleep and leave him alone, he'll wake up himself. Then Jesus explains to them very clearly in verse 14, Lazarus is dead. I'm going to go and wake him up. So Jesus is troubling, isn't he? And I'm, I know many of you will have had this sort of experience. You send out a call for help to Jesus. You have reason to think he cares about you. You've put your trust in him, perhaps, or you've heard that he cares. And he does not do what he ought to do. What we think he should do. Lord, the one who you love is sick. And this little family group, Mary, Martha and Lazarus, are, seem to be some of Jesus' closest friends. He's often at their home. They clearly love him. In, in, all, in, in a number of the Gospels, we run into this little family unit and Jesus doesn't do what he should do. Jesus lets the one whom he loves die. He lets the two sisters who he love enter a terrible period of grieving. Jesus is baffling at this point. Now he says, I'm going to wake him up. He's got bigger plans than they could have imagined. He says, death will not have the last word here. I will bring glory to God through this. But at just at the ordinary human level, it will be terribly troubling that Jesus did not do what a decent friend should do at that point, as we would expect. 
He finally arrives and Lazarus has been dead for four days. So what's Sunday today? What's that, Wednesday? He's well and truly dead and buried. Very hot country. And it says, what, what Jesus does is he talks to Martha, who comes out and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 21. It's repeated by her sister in verse 32. Clearly, the two sisters, the friends of Jesus, who've just lost their brother, are saying, if Jesus had been here, he wouldn't have died. Where the heck was he? We asked for help. We expected help. He's helped all sorts of people he doesn't even know the name of who come to him for help. And yet he doesn't do what we think he should do here. It's a mystery. And then Jesus responds to her, to Martha, who we know from the other Gospels is a pretty strong woman. She's a very impressive lady. Verse 20, 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And that's an extraordinary statement. Imagine if I stood here, or worse, imagine if I stood here and we were at a, a, a funeral and there's a coffin here and I stand up here and say, I'm the resurrection. I'm the one who can reverse death because the word resurrection literally means the standing up. There's nothing spiritual about it. It's nonsense that some people try to say that the resurrection of Jesus is just the spirit of Jesus. No, no, no. The word means the standing up. The resurrection of the body is the standing up of the corpse. It's a real solid physical thing. Jesus, I'm the reverser of death. Now, that'd be crazy if I said this here, but it'd be easy enough here because no, no one's here to test me. <laughs> but say that in the presence of a dead body and you can rightfully say, okay, big talker, let's see some action. But Jesus says, and there, there is simply no parallel to this anywhere in the world of someone, one of the great founders of some human religion daring to say, I don't just reframe death so you can sort of bear it, I can reverse it. In fact, I am the reverser of death. Huge truth that he says to Martha in order to comfort her. She answers very strongly. He says, do you believe this? Because that's the question Jesus is always asking, isn't he? Here's the truth about me. Do you believe me? Right? She says, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who is to come into the world. So he gives her truth that should soothe and lift her spirits. And then in verse 28 to 37, we come to the tears. The other sister comes. Why does she come? Because Jesus calls for her. He goes, and Martha goes back, and she says to Mary, her sister, uh, the Lord is calling you. She goes out uh, and says to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Then it says this, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? He can't do anything now. But if he had got here earlier, since he could, you know, do you know reverse blindness maybe he could have kept him alive so jesus wept now this is not a useless bit of information uh, sometimes when people speak about greek the original language you know, they're just wasting your time and sometimes using it as a trick to avoid the obvious meaning of the text but this this doesn't change anything but it gives us some understanding the word of mary weeping and the word of the other Jews who'd come, her friends, weeping, is not the same word used of Jesus weeping. The word of Mary and her friends is the word for wailing. It's a sobbing. You, you don't need to look at someone to know if they're weeping with this word. It, it's, a, it's a very powerful uh, outward expression of sorrow. And that's used of Jesus in the other time he publicly weeps, which is in Luke 19, when he comes over the mountain and sees the glorious picture of the Jerusalem temple and everyone's praising him and all, everyone's rejoicing. And Jesus, it's this word, he, he weeps in this loud, sobbing, sort of almost extravagant way. He, he does do that sort of weeping. But the word used of Jesus is the sort of weeping that you have to look at the person to know they're weeping. It's the word of a tear. It's, it's that. It's, it's that, you know, we, 
you, you look at them, oh, they're weeping. Or maybe you can hear it in their voice. So Jesus weeps. And I want to suggest to you the first response of those there was to misunderstand him. Because they said, see how he loved him. What they think is that Jesus is weeping because he loved Lazarus. Like, like you do cry at the funeral of someone you love, even if you understand that they've gone to heaven. You've lost them. The relationship is broken. So they assume that Jesus is weeping because he loves Lazarus and has lost him. We know better, don't we? Because Jesus has said in the first section, I'm, Lazarus is asleep, that is dead. I'm going to awaken him. We know that Jesus thinks he's going to have afternoon tea with Lazarus. As far as he's concerned, like, you know, when Alison has a sleep, she's working night shifts or something like that, and I see that she's asleep, I don't weep. <laughs> she's sleeping. If any of you have had the joy of having children, you never weep when they're sleeping because <laughs> you know that they will awaken. Right? And as far as Jesus is concerned, and there's a beautiful, one of the, Two or three times, and he only does it a couple of times, does Jesus resurrect someone else from the dead. He resurrects the little girl who's freshly dead, unlike Lazarus, who's rotten, stale, stinky dead. And he says to a little girl, get up. And, and he uses the word, Talitha Kun, the, the word he uses, and it's recorded in the original language he spoke because it was so impressive. It is the language that a, a mother or a father would use to wake up a little girl. Sweetie, it's time to get up. That's how hard it is for Jesus to deal with Lazarus' death. So he's not, he's not weeping. They've misunderstood the cause of the tears. We'll come back to that in a second. And then lastly, the, the, the troubling Jesus, the truth from Jesus' lips, the tears from Jesus' eyes that are so wonderful, and then lastly, the triumph of Jesus when he calls Lazarus out of the tomb. Boy, that would have been fantastic to see. Um, there's a guy who some of you would have been blessed by who's been dead for some decades now called Martin Lloyd-Jones, a brilliant uh, Harley Street medical doctor who then became a preacher. And uh, as a kid, apparently, he was being taught Sunday school in Wales, where so many of the world's best people come from. And he, um, he's a um, scripture teacher. That Sunday school teacher been taking them through John. In John 10, it's got, you know, Jesus knows his own sheep by name. And the Sunday school teacher asked when they got to this part where Jesus says, Lazarus, here, or Lazarus, come forth, said, why does Jesus call, why does he say it like that? Why does he say, Lazarus, come forth? She was thinking, because Jesus knows his sheep by name. But Martin Lloyd-Jones made what is, I think, a brilliant comment, as children can often do, and said, no, no, no. He said, Lazarus, because otherwise all the dead people... It'll all be up. Lazarus, the rest of you stay where you are. Right? <laughs> but Lazarus, here. And out shuffles Lazarus. And we see the great triumph that Jesus and the power that Jesus has over that thing which will overpower you sooner or later has the last word in us all. And Jesus shows his triumph and power. So let's go back and look at this thing, Jesus weeps. You stop and think about that, Jesus weeps. You could rightly say, so what? Duh. What else do you do at funerals? Well, you do other things. But I mean, all sorts of people weep. The worst people in the world weep. The best people in the world weep. The young weep, the old weep. If ever there's a place you're going to weep, it's at a funeral. Particularly the funeral of a friend. So in a sense, it's hardly significant. But of course, that's to misunderstand what's going on. See, who's weeping here? Jesus weeps. Who is Jesus? Well, he is the one who lets Lazarus die. So when you think, well, what are you, what are you crying for? Thanks for you, it's your own handiwork. What's he upset about? He, in a sense, let it happen. But it's also the guy who's going to raise him up. So it's at least weird to work out why is he weeping when Lazarus is just sleeping as far as he's concerned. Well, the context is everything. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit. We don't have time to look at that. It's a, it's a terrifically wonderful word. 
I do sometimes talk about it at funerals, so you might hear it then. Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? Come and see. Jesus wept. The thing that moves Jesus to tears is Mary's tears. Now, props in a way that you don't get to do. I am quite often at funerals of people I've never, ever met. And sometimes I've been at the funeral of someone I've never, ever met. They literally mean nothing to me. And the people in the building are sometimes all strangers. And alas, I'm not the most tender-hearted human being as I'd like to be. But even I at times have to hold back tears because I think it's not going to be helpful if I lose it. And it's, it's just ordinary human empathy. Right? And Jesus weeps. And what stirs up the tears of the one who's about to turn a funeral into a party is human empathy. He is moved by the sorrow and the suffering, even though he knows it's only going to be short. Well, two things by way of application for us. To nick a phrase from the book Isaiah, behold your God. Have a look at this, because this you want to know what God is like? You know, I, I do think one of the verses, it's an easy verse to learn. In fact, Stephen King, the writer of horror stories and things like that, and the Green Mile and other great things, he was once as a kid at the school, he was at, they had to learn a Bible verse by next week. So the cunning dog learnt this verse. Jesus wept. That was hard work. But you see, behold your God... We have a very powerful being, don't we? Like, he knows what's going to happen to Lazarus, although he's a long way away. He can reverse death. He has that power. Uh, as we're going to see when we look at Mark's gospel next term, if you watch Jesus and you're not a little fearful, you haven't seen him. He has such ridiculous power that people go, who is this man? It's one of the constant questions. Who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this man to speak like this? Behold your God, Jesus is not just powerful, but he says in John 14, verses that I think we, we need to, if we don't know it off by heart, we need to have it front and centre because it's such an important verse for us as human beings and it's such a helpful verse in helping others learn about God and Jesus. Philip says to Jesus on the night before he's put to death, so he's, Philip's been with Jesus for three years, and Philip says, oh, this has been great, but Lord, if we could just see God... We would be satisfied. And you remember Jesus' answer? Philip, have I been with you for so long and you don't know who I am? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now I know we've touched on this verse before. Right? But no one in the world who knows anything about God would ever say such a statement. There's no way in a bazillion years, and I don't say this disrespectfully, that Muhammad would ever say or suggest or think, if you've seen me, you've seen Allah. Right? That is just pure blasphemy to say, if you want to know what God is like, look at me. I'd say to people, if you want to know what God is like, don't look at me, please. Right? But Jesus, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What is the Father, what's he like at the funeral? of a broken family. He weeps. He weeps with those who weep. Right? This, is, this is the importance of this statement. It is a great window into the heart of God. It doesn't answer all our questions. The truth that Jesus says about his ultimate victory over death, the triumph that Jesus shows, all, all add to the general picture of how we deal with the terrible suffering and pain that, that, that life is full of. But this is a significant thing. In the meantime, even before we get to the resurrection of Lazarus, how does God, how does Jesus, same thing, how do they feel about our pain? Well, what, what Jesus doesn't do, he doesn't have a smirk on his face and say, Mary, cut the tears out. Watch this. Right. He's moved. God is repeatedly and rightfully said, the almighty God who made the universe is a tender-hearted God. 
in the midst of the unspeakable pain that many in this building are going through and the huge disappointment and the huge, why didn't God? He weeps with those who weep. He doesn't slap us around and say, pull yourself together, I'm going to die for you. How dare you be in pain and confusion? They're all happening, they're all swirling around at the same time. This is a reflection on stuff that is in the Old Testament. Everything you see in Jesus is reflected earlier in the Old Testament. In, in Isaiah 63, uh, verse 9, it says this. And this is speaking about a very... When Israel... It's describing Israel when they were at their worst. And they were going through terrible pain as loving discipline from God after hundreds and hundreds of years of them killing the prophets and worshipping every, almost everybody but God. And they're in suffering. And listen to what it says in the midst of their suffering. In all their distress, he too was distressed. Isn't that amazing? Right? They're receiving punishment for hundreds and hundreds of years of sin. And yet even as they're suffering, he is distressed. In all their distress, he too was distressed. To see Jesus weeping is to get a great insight into God the Father. Let me read you from a poem I did one year of English at Sydney University and I've learned everything there was to know about English so I could drop out. But I did an essay on William Blake, that wonderfully mad Irish poet. Let me read you one of his poems, or not, not, not the whole of it, called On Another's Sorrow. He writes this. Can I see another's woe and not be in sorrow too? Can I see another's grief and not seek for some kind relief. He skips down a bit. Think not that thou can sigh a sigh, and thy maker is not by. Think not that thou canst weep a tear, and thy maker is not near. Oh, he gives to us his joy, that our grief he may destroy. It's beautiful, isn't it? And it's right. Think not that you can sigh a sigh and your maker is not by. Think not that thou canst weep a tear and thy maker is not near. He gets that view that the almighty God cares so deeply for your pain, even if it's pain that's in a sense self-inflicted, right? that he weeps with us in our pain, even as he's driving on to something far better. Here's the interesting thing. One of the phrases I find really helpful in maintaining sanity and joy in all, thing, in all sorts of things is this one. It's, from, it's a line from a hymn. Um, this too will pass. Right? This too will pass. I normally say it when things are problematic or when a friend of mine is going through a difficult time. This will pass. COVID will pass. Right? It'll be a footnote in history. Right? All sorts of suffering. Great joy and triumph will pass. <laughs> Great strength and health. I, I heard this week, as I was doing some background work for this, all sorts of interesting stuff. I learned about tears that I'd love to share, but it would be a waste of your time. Um, but basically, from 25 on, that's your peak physically. From then on, it's, it's going backwards. So if some of you aren't 25, you've got some good years ahead of you. Right? But, you know, this too will pass. Your strength, your triumph, your glory, your pain. This too will pass. The grief at this funeral is about to break into the most insane joy unimaginable. Right? But Jesus doesn't just say, this will pass. In the midst of the moment, and it is only a few moments before the joy will be eaten up, the, the sorrow will be eaten up, he weeps with us. God is not distant. God is not cool. God is not without heart and emotion for us in the midst of our pain. God is not Dr. Spock. Right? Although I understand Dr. Spock is more complicated, but having watched about half an hour of that show, what would I know? But I understand he's, he's the brain, he's rationality, he's Mr. Science rather than Mr. Emotion. God is nothing like that, that there's part of the package that's missing. Behold your God. He will win. You know, if your trust is in him, you will laugh forevermore and joy. This is a comedy, not a triumph you're a part of. A comedy, not a tragedy you're a part of. But he weeps with us in the midst of the pain, even when it's self-inflicted. Behold your God. This is why this is important. And more briefly, behold the healthy, mature human. Right? Behold what it is to be a healthy human. 
in the book of Romans, chapter 12, and we are coming back to Romans, second term next, uh, second term this year. I heard some naughty people suggest we were just missing some of the more challenging chapters, as if. But let me read you from Romans 12. Here's another easy verse to learn off by heart. Listen to this. The first part's harder than the second part. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. It's often harder, isn't it, to rejoice with those who rejoice? Some of you know Alice and I are trying to find a, a, a house. We're looking down at Bombardieri, the place that should have been ours, but something went wrong. Right? I think we only offered $7.8 million. You know, uh, I've been saying to Alison, this is like buying a house in an insane asylum. The price is ridiculous. But, you know, if you want a house in an asylum, you know. anyhow. But if, if I came to church and someone said, Ian, I know you're just in Bombardy. We just picked up the, you know, the most amazing little house, blah, 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 for only 10,000 bucks. The person wanted to get rid of it. It's hard sometimes to rejoice with those who rejoice. And they go, what? <laughs> Weeping with those who weep is a little easier. But can I suggest, you know, make this something. This, this is Jesus. He is weeping with those who weep. That's why he's weeping. And that is a picture of the heart of God. Yes, the Almighty. Yes, the judge of the living and the dead. Yes, the maker of the entire cosmos. But he also weeps with those who weep. And there's much to weep about. I listened to one of those heretics in part of my education for last week's sermon, a, a guy called Bell, who's quite well known, made quite a lot of money, and it, it, just listening to him, trying to, under, to be fair to him, and he made a really stupid comment. It was only because... Sorry, that's probably... No, no, he's, he's a public figure. He, he can cope with it. And the only comment he made about Jesus, and he only said it because he was le lured into it by the interviewers who weren't Christian, where he, he spoke about... You know, you see, all the spiritual people, all the really inside... Buddha, priests, Jesus, they've always got smiles on their faces. Well, not in the art that I've seen of Jesus... He's the man of sorrows, is the way he's described, and acquainted with grief. Right? More likely to weep than to giggle. I have no doubt he laughed at a good joke, but that's not the essential thing. But there's much to weep about. Australian history, it's magnificent and it's awful. There's much to be sorrowful about. If you've got friends, can I ask you, work on, watch yourself, pray about being a person who weeps with those who weep and are not quick with advice. Or that it could be worse. Let me find you a silver lining in this. You can find it. But that's, that's not, I think, the first calling. Sometimes when we try to get people to look at the bright side of life, we're just trying to avoid our own pain. It's too painful to go there with them. But whether in your home group with a friend, listen deeply and feel what they're feeling is what the Bible's talking about. Weep with those who weep. It's not a sign of maturity that you can be cynical. It's a sign of being burnt and the need to recover. It's not a sign. In fact, I was listening to, Alison, I was listening to a psychopath who decided to murder his father just to see what it was like. He, he, he said, as he stood over his father with a hammer, he said, I couldn't think of a single thing he'd done to harm me. But I think, he, I think he's, a, he's a very fine Christian debater now, but he's, he's, he's a bit weird even when you watch him. But he spoke about the fact that he never felt any emotions. When his dog, as a kid, you know, Kim talked about the terrible pain you have when, you're, you know, when your pet dies. You know, when his dog, Goliath, died, this guy, David Wood, said, I, I, you know, everyone else was crying, but I couldn't think, well, it's dead, so what? When one of his best friends died, in the end, he discovered he's some sort of a psychopath. Well, he's loved by God and very useful, but he's unusual. To not weep with those who weep to not feel the sorrow that other people feel is not because you're mature. It's because there's some calluses where there need to be not calluses. Jesus is the model of what it is to be truly human. So, friends, here it is. Jesus wept. You remember that, that movie, Men in Black, the first one? Um, and the cat had a tiny little necklace, and, and, and yet it was a whole universe. And... and Humans were mocked because, because it was a big and important thing. We thought it would be big. This is like that. This is like the universe around the neck of the cat. Right? So beautiful. It's a beautiful 
insight into the heart of God. He will in the end, Jesus will in the end bleed for you as well, which is the other proof. But that he will weep with us in our pain and that we're called to weep with those who weep. And that reality of God helps us to rejoice always, right? to implement what is the shortest verse in the original language. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that your son is the image of you. When we see him, we see you. I thank you that you are a tender-hearted God. We know you are the judge of the living and the dead. And it's a fearful thing to fall into your hands unforgiven. And yet, God, nonetheless, we thank you that you not only died for us in your son's sacrifice, but in his life you show your tenderness. Help us, Lord God, as we go through various heartbreaks to understand and to believe that you are the God who weeps with those who weep, even as we wait for the day when you restore all things. Help us, Father, to grow a little bit more like Jesus in being tender-hearted. We pray this in his name. Amen.
Let's come to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can meet together to hear your word and sing your praise and share fellowship with one another. We thank you that we have the peace and security that enables us to do this, even within the coronavirus restrictions. May we never take this for granted, but acknowledge it as a precious gift from you and use it effectively in your service. We pray for your people who live in places where there is no peace and who are unable to openly worship you or who face oppression and violence if they do. We ask you to uphold and protect them, provide for their needs and give them opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with those around them. We pray for the people of Tonga as they work to repair the damage from the volcano and tsunami. Please, please bring comfort to the bereaved, provide medical help for the injured, and practical help where homes and infrastructure have been damaged. We pray for those who are bringing aid to the country from outside, that they will work well with the Tongan nationals, and the aid and provision will be quickly provided where it is most needed. We pray for those among us who are travelling away from St Matthew's during the summer holidays. Please protect them while they are away. Enable them to have a refreshing break from the routine of work and bring them safely back to us. We thank you for our staff and ministry leaders and the many volunteers who have committed themselves to serve at St Matthew's this year. As the recommencement of regular minister, ministry activities approaches, we pray for strength, wisdom and guidance for all ministry leaders as they plan activities for 2022. Please help us all to be faithful in your service so that your kingdom will grow in this parish. We pray for the upcoming Christianity Explored course. We ask for wisdom and guidance for those leading the course, that they will be able to meet the needs of those attending. We pray that as they get to know Jesus through reading your word, all those who do attend will come to understand that he is the source of truth and life. We thank you that the ministry at ADFA, the Australian Defence Force College, can recommence and we pray for the upcoming services, that many of the new trainees and continuing trainees will attend these services and will want to learn more about Jesus. Please give special wisdom and insight to the ADFA ministry team as they work alongside new students making the transition from civilian to military life and with continuing students as they do their service specific training. May there be many encouraging gospel conversations that will lead these young people to serve their Lord and Saviour as well as their nation. Lord Jesus, you wept as you shared the grief of those who had lost friends and family, and you comforted and healed those who were suffering from the ravages of death, disease and struggle that we have in this fallen world. So we pray for those among us who are facing life's challenges. We pray for your healing, provision and peace for all those who are recovering from surgery, undergoing chemotherapy and other treatments, or struggling with health needs in general, whether physical, medical, mental or spiritual. And we take a few moments to remember those who are known to us personally. Heavenly Father, we ask for healing and comfort for all those brought before you, that you would meet their needs in body, soul and spirit. Please give them a firm trust in your goodness, that they may know your presence and find peace and strength in the sovereignty of their Heavenly Father. Faithful God, you have promised to hear the prayers of all who ask in Jesus' name. In your mercy, accept our prayers, 
and fulfill our requests and desires as may be best for us according to your will and good purposes. Grant us in this life knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life eternal. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now let's bring our prayers together by saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.